Today, I want to talk about binary versus continuum skill sets and why they matter for the GMAT Focus Edition. Let me just define exactly what I mean here. <laughs> Many of us tend to think in a binary way without realizing it. Think about it this way. Do you consider yourself consistent or not? Or instead, do you see consistency as a continuum and you ask yourself, how consistent am I? Similarly, when you're looking at a data set, do you consider yourself as above or below the median? Or do you think how far above or how far below the median am I? Similarly, do you think about things as I like this or I don't like this? Or do you think about it as how much do I like this? Now, those are such broad and general categories that you're probably thinking like, yeah, I think about them differently at different times, <laughs> which is totally fine. So why does this matter? Well, I just want to introduce the concept and I want to talk about why it's relevant for the GMAT. So the key here is that the continuum mindset is a mindset of constant potential improvement, whereas the binary mindset is different. The binary mindset, I think, comes from a natural laziness of the brain. And it, it's not like a good or bad laziness. It's just like a biological fact. The brain is the most calorie-consuming part of our bodies. Please <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong about that, any medical professionals in, in the building. <laughs> but I, as far as I know, it is one of the most calorie-intensive parts of the body, if not the most. And... That means that our brain has come up with many ways of turning off things that don't need to be paid attention to because attention can in some ways be measured with physical resources that the brain has to consume to maintain attention on that thing. So this binary mindset of, oh, I don't like that is like a decision. It doesn't need to be thought about anymore. It's just done don't like it. Or I do like this. Again, a decision. It's a permanent state of liking it. And I don't have to think about it anymore. But if I ask how much do I like this? Or could I like this more? Now, it's almost a never-ending task. And there's times and places for both mindsets. In fact, the binary mindset is super helpful without prioritization and the ability to delete things or not focus on certain things then it would be very difficult to lead. Like leadership would be kind of weird if there was no need to prioritize or no ability to prioritize. But that binary mindset is not always the optimal mindset for GMAT prep. And I want to talk about when you sh I recommend using it and when the binary mindset is better. So within your focus areas... I recommend using the continuum or gradient mindset as I refer to it. It's it's like a constant continuum where there's not necessarily an end point. It's just things could always be higher or lower on the continuum versus binary is like on or off. And if you don't know what I mean by focus areas, I'll just briefly rehash the concept. Let's say you took a practice test and you analyzed the data. If you've listened to any of my content, you know I really recommend picking the top three and going all in on those before the next practice exam. And I've found that when people try to do more than three things at the same time or improve more than three things at the same time, they usually end up improving none or they improve very little. And it winds up being like a frustrating, somewhat self-defeating cycle. So I'm trying to help you cultivate a better mindset. Let's, let's not say even better or worse, but just cultivate a more efficient, more productive mindset when it comes to your focus areas and your non-focus areas. For example, what if you were to rate yourself on a scale of 0 to 100 in terms of how consistent you are? That would be a little bit different than me asking you, do you consider yourself a consistent person or not? Or have you been consistent with your GMAT prep? Some of you might have the automatic instinct to say like, yeah, I'm consistent. Or no, I definitely haven't been consistent. Some of you might have the automatic instinct of, well, I could always be more consistent. 
And if consistency is something that you think is holding you back, you might want to consider making that one of your focus areas before the next exam or just a focus area in general in your life. And if you naturally gravitate to the binary mindset, you might want to consider shifting your approach to the continuum mindset and asking yourself questions like, well, could you be even more consistent? How often are you late? How consistent are you with when you get up in the morning? What are your routines like? Do they vary a lot or are they quite consistent? Now, obviously, I'm expanding the concept probably beyond the GMAT, although some of those things could definitely affect your GMAT performance. But those are, are more things that might just affect your performance in general, how other people perceive you, what kind of results you get, how much influence you have, how much respect you have, how much people value your ideas, those kinds of things. Now, maybe consistency isn't what's holding you back. It's just an example of the concept. Another example of the concept. What if I asked you to rate yourself on a scale of 0 to 100 in terms of your intensity? Would you consider yourself intense when you're focused and studying? Are you bringing a lot of energy to the situa situation? Or would you consider yourself not intense at all or that you lack intensity? Or would you rather think about it as how intense are you? Could you be more focused and dialed in when you're working? Are there things like noise-canceling headphones or supplements or better sleep, diet, and exercise routines or more restful downtime that you could engage with that would improve the intensity of your focus, the intensity of your results, how effective you are with the time that you have? Where would you place yourself on that scale of 0 to 100? And if you're a 100, what does 110 look like? What does 150 look like, if that even exists? It's just something to consider. It's, it's opening yourself up to the possibility that anything could be improved upon, iterated, or expanded. One final example. Would you consider yourself good at following directions? Some of you might consider yourself great at following directions. You're very thorough. Others of you might constantly prefer to do things your own way or maybe even rebel against a systematic process. But what you might want to consider is a continuum of following directions. How good are you at executing the plan that you have in front of you? How good are you at making high quality plans in the first place? Not just yes or no, I'm executing on this plan, but how well am I executing on the plan? And that naturally leads to the question, could I be executing better? It just naturally opens you up to a path to improving in that particular area. So this, I personally think, is very important in general. And I, I've found it to be an extremely valuable mental tool, mental frame, for improving results in areas that I am focusing on at any particular time. But I think it's also really, really valuable for the GMAT. And this is, this is going to be, I hope, very helpful for those of you who feel like you're performing well, but you're looking for that next level you're not satisfied with how you've been performing. And maybe you're not even so sure what's been holding you back from finding that next gear, that extra gear in your GMAT prep. Now, really quick, before I go further with this and start to adapt it to the exam more, I do want to mention one key, which is that if something is not a focus area, then that's a good time to just put it in the binary mindset of good enough, won't need to revisit this anytime soon or ever, or not good enough, we'll definitely need to revisit this later, but not a priority right now. And the value of that binary mindset is it soaks up less mental energy. And that allows you more energy and attention to focus on the things that are going to be the biggest opportunities for you to improve. If you think about this as an investor, you think, okay, what are all the potential investments I, should, I could make? And which ones have the right mix of risk, upside, lack of downside, et cetera, for my personal criteria. You look around and you try to find the best areas where you can focus your energy. Now, maybe that's not a great example for some of you because maybe you work in an investment world that's more about defense and uh, preservation and diversification. That, that probably is not the perfect analogy for GMAT. GMAT you tend to get the best results by focusing your energy for relatively short sprints on relatively few focus areas, getting those up to a certain level, 
and then retesting yourself and then finding several new focus areas or maybe doubling down on the previous three because they weren't good enough or they weren't as good as you thought they were going to be and they need more energy. That's what I've found creates the most efficient results for most people. Now, what happens when you put the right things in the binary bin, <laughs> mental bin, and the right things in the gradient or continuum bin is that you you unlock a new level of discretionary effort. This has been my experience. So it's it's not the minimum effort to just get by. You're unlocking this new level of mental energy and effort because you're realizing you could always be better and you might not have even considered what the next level of whatever skill set could even look like. Now you may have, but I, I think you will find this valuable if you try it on. Okay, this is generally, I've found with myself and many people I've worked with over the many years I've been doing this, that it will lead to better attention to detail and generally better results. Now, I'll give you a system for implementing this. I'll make it very specific. Right now, I'm just talking about the concept so that hopefully that's quite clear and refined enough so that you can get a lot out of the system that I'm going to give you. Real quick, if you're not sure how to pick your focus areas, then I'd strongly recommend going back to the how to structure your GMAT focus study time episode from, I think, probably January of 2024. And that'll help you figure out exactly what you should be focusing on, depending on where you are in your prep process. But again, the, just the super, super, super reduced basics are you take a practice exam, you look at which areas are coming up the most often, which areas you're missing the most often, which areas are taking you the longest, and you try to pick a top three that you believe will move your score the most if you improve, and you focus your energy on improving those. Probably 80% of your energy goes to focusing on those, and the other 20% of your energy goes to maintaining everything else that you've already built. That's that's a good like no-fail mix. That's not going to be the totally optimized version of that for every single one of you. In my experience, efficiency tends to come from customization and adaptation for the individual. But within a public format, that's sort of like the quote unquote can't lose mix where like you you probably will get great results doing that, even if they're not the like quote unquote like 100% optimized results for you personally. So if you have questions on any of this or you're looking for a more customized piece of advice, then feel free to reach out to us on current social channels at the GMAT strategy, or you can check out our video on our website at the GMAT strategy.com. It'll show you how to reach your dream GMAT score in half the normal time. I hope you find it extremely valuable. Many, many people have, I've gotten incredible feedback on it for a long time. And if, if you want more help, then there's the opportunity to get that there if you want it, but there's definitely no pressure either way here, everybody just, uh, trying to be the best partner I can be for you on this journey that was very long and intense for me. And I could have used a lot of this advice back in the day. A lot of this stuff I've sought out, built from the ground up for myself and for my clients of always trying to become a better version of myself, a better coach, a better provider, and just just win, basically just become uh, the type of person who can who can win at a really high level on a really consistent basis. So Let's return to how these two mindsets might be adapted specifically for the GMAT. I'll give you a good example, something I've heard a lot of this year since the new exam came out, which is a lot of people in DI have what I would call like just okay organization. Like they think it's enough. And so they don't see that as their problem. And then they, they're they wondering like, why am I slow at data insights questions or gosh, I've done so many data insights questions. Why is my score not moving? And it, it, it probably is, I don't know this for sure, but it, there's a very, very high likelihood that it's because you're just doing the problems instead of asking yourself, how well am I doing these problems? You might be in the binary state of mind of the problem is either done or not done, or I learned something or I didn't learn something. And you might want to shift your mindset to how well did I do the problem? How much did I learn from this problem? Did I learn the maximum amount? Did I learn the optimal amount? Or did I not learn anything? 
from this question. I just completed it. And in case you haven't heard me say this before, I'll say it now, completing practice problems does not move your score. <laughs> Learning from practice problems is what moves your score. And that, that just so you know, that was a mistake I made back in the day. It's, it's not like you're a bad person or something like that. If you made that mistake, it's actually a very logical assumption that just completing a bunch of problems would move your score because a lot of other tests work that way. But I've personally found, and many, many, many of my clients have found, and maybe many of you have already found or, or may find, that just completing a bunch of practice problems is not a reliable score mover. Let's put it that way. Okay, so this is why this continuum mindset, part of the reason this continuum mindset can be so valuable for you. Another example of this, did I review this problem versus how well did I review this problem? It's a totally different frame of mind. Again, you're going to unlock that next level of discretionary effort, not just the, okay, what's the minimum effort required for this? Now, what's very paradoxical about this, I've found, is when you adopt this state of mind, you actually do need less overall effort because you're learning more on a per-problem basis. <laughs> it's a technique I use with a lot of my clients. And it's it, again, is a little counterintuitive, a little paradoxical, where you think by unlocking this next level of discretionary effort, you're working harder, but actually it's a mix of greater intensity, greater focus, which means you have more leverage. And that means you get more done with less total energy and you move faster through the process overall because one hour of your study time is equal to maybe 10 hours of another person's study time. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get those kinds of gains just adopting this on your own, but it's very possible. I've seen it happen many, many, many times. And I'm just inviting you to experiment with it. I'm not even saying like, hey, definitely do this. Just give it a shot. If it's not for you, that's fine. But I think you might like it. So let me ask this question in a, in a different way. Rather than why am I not fast enough at DI, the question is, how could I be faster at DI? Or what are all the potential ways that my DI approach could be better? Could I be more organized? Could I become a better reader? Could I become better at managing time? Could I research a better strategy for handling certain types of questions? It naturally leads to a state of mind where you're going to explore more possibilities. Now, not all of those possibilities are guaranteed to work, but if you stick it out long enough, eventually you will find one that does work. Now, perhaps obviously this is the value that a lot of coaches bring to people is they've already experimented with a wide variety of approaches and they can just give you the top three or look at your specific situation and say, oh, for you, you're probably going to get the best result with this. Oh, look at that. You tried it, score went up. Yeah, this is the, the, the good professionals out there, <laughs> the good to great to exceptional professionals out there, they can do that for you. So this process of testing and iterating is, I personally think, one of the most data validated success strategies in business over the past 30 years. <laughs> think about a couple examples, all right? Chat GPT comes to mind as a recent example. They just put out a version of it and then quickly started iterating based on customer feedback and data. Meta is a good example of this. They started with Facebook and then now have transitioned to a wide variety of platforms, most recently computing platforms with a lot of potential for the future, like glasses, mixed reality, AR. Now, are we kind of at the early, early stages of that? Definitely, in my opinion, <laughs> but as someone who experienced, quote unquote, VR in maybe the 90s when it was like first coming on the scene as like, you know, kind of this nerdy gaming thing <laughs> to now seeing what it's developed into, seeing how immersive it's becoming and then seeing these other players enter the space. It's not hard to imagine that there's a lot of upside there after a few iterations like, you know, the Vision Pro is like so hot right now, quote unquote. And maybe that's going to fall off. Maybe it's just going to be a fad. Maybe people are going to be like, yeah, whatever. We don't like this. But maybe they're going to iterate it and maybe Vision Pro 10 or Vision Pro 3 or Chat GPT 11 is going to be like, whoa, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> this is way better than my laptop or my smartphone or whatever. Okay, just a couple examples. Amazon would be a good example of that. They started in a niche to get into e-commerce and then they quickly iterated. Famous for being customer obsessed and iterating based on feedback and data. 
this, maybe it's not the most data validated business success strategy in the past 30 years. Obviously that's debatable, but there's a lot of data to back up the test and iterate process. One of my coaches always says the secret to greatness is refinement. You don't start out great. You just start. And then you keep getting better and better and better at that thing over time. So I'm putting all this out on the table so that we can ultimately take all these ideas that I've introduced and funnel them into a process that will help you stay more motivated, help you stay more inspired, help you challenge yourself to keep improving even when you don't feel like it. And again, unlock that next level, that next gear of effort, intensity, energy, focus that maybe you didn't even realize you were capable of. And that, that's one of the things I enjoy the most about working with people directly is seeing the lights go on, so to speak. And it's exciting. It's fun because I remember what it was like pre those breakthroughs and post those breakthroughs. And I guess just speaking for myself, like my life is almost immeasurably better on the other side of, of these breakthroughs. It, it's, it's almost unrecognizable in a good way. So a couple more questions to consider is not just am I disciplined or not, but how disciplined am I? It's a, you turn it into a continuum, not just am I optimized or not, but how optimized am I? And if you go back to my balance episode, I give you a system for constantly re-optimizing that balance point over time so that you can sustain this kind of next level of effort without burning yourself out and hating your life. And obviously those things that pretty much nobody wants. So the truth is there's always a next level. And the question is, is this important enough to invest energy in right now? And that comes back to the focus areas. Now, without bringing the discussion too wide, obviously the question there is how important is this focus area? And again, that's why I recommend just picking the top three because most of us are going to be uh, compulsive, obsessive optimizers. <laughs> it's part of what makes us great business people and what will ultimately probably be one of the things that makes you great in and after business school. Not necessarily don't need that, but it's just a pattern I've seen. And it'll just help you find those top three things that have the biggest return on your time and energy, which is what most of us are looking for in the GMAT prep process. Most of us are not just doing it for the sake of it, but instead we're just trying to knock it out as efficiently as possible get the highest score possible, which is another way of saying optimizing the situation so that we can move on to the B school part and the post B school part, which is probably the part that most of you are the most excited about. So not just did I get this done, but how well did I get it done? Not just am I tracking, but how well am I tracking? Those are the questions to start asking. Okay. And that puts you in that constant and never ending improvement mindset. Even if you have been stuck unconsciously in the binary mindset. It's also a longer term mindset, which I've found a lot of value in. I typically make better decisions, both in the short and long term. Again, I unlock that next level of discretionary effort over time. And there's a compounding effect there where I can, I, my work capacity grows in addition to my actual results growing. I have more control over my results, more endurance for projects that take longer than expected, all things that tend to correlate with being able to do valuable things. Now, that discretionary effort for yourself, when you get good at unlocking that discretionary effort for yourself, I've noticed as a benefit, you get better at unlocking that discretionary effort for your team, for the people around you. You become a better coach, a better teacher, a better leader. You become more valuable both to yourself and to the groups that you operate in, businesses, families, friend groups, wh whatever your thing is. So let's talk about how that applies specifically to the GMAT a little deeper. And let me start to help you systematize this now that we've got the key ideas out on the table. And I apologize if that was just like a lot. <laughs> but my greatest hope is that I've defined all of that well enough that everything I'm about to go through is going to click for you in in a profound and, and helpful way. That's my goal. So let's take a few GMAT specific areas and assign yourself a number from zero to 100. Starting with execution. The question should be, how well am I executing? From zero to 100, ask yourself, think about the last seven days, the last seven weeks, maybe the last seven months. Zero to 100. 
how well are you executing? Maybe even think about how, how much better you're executing now versus before. Maybe you've gotten worse. No judgment. Everybody slips. Everybody gets distracted. It's part of the human condition. I don't know. Maybe not everybody, but like, let's be real. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> the, the, uh, such a large proportion that it might as well be everybody. Precision of language is important to me. So hey, maybe it's not everybody. And if if you never get distracted, I'm I'm very jealous. <laughs> but the, the key, and you've heard me talk about this before in, in past week's episodes, if you've been following my content for some time, I personally think it's all about recommitting. So no matter where you are or where you were or whatever, it's like, well, what's it going to take to get to get where you want to go right now? Like you've got today, probably not going to do too much about changing the past. What can you do to have influence right now in the present and, and the future with your, your execution? So there's two levels of execution to audit here. The first is the macro level, which is your overall plan. And you don't want to ask, is my plan good enough? But you want to ask, how good is my plan? When you shift to that state of mind of evaluating the actual steps that you're taking, you will continue to improve it and optimize it. And the better your plan gets over time, the more efficient your results will be. That's the macro version of execution. The micro version of execution is more based on the small picture. Something like, not do I know exponents, but how well do I know exponents? Not did I learn algebra, but how well did I learn algebra? Not, is my content knowledge good enough, but how good is my content knowledge? How good is my scratch work, what I'm writing down when I'm doing questions? How good are my reading skills? How well am I comprehending these things? And asking yourself those questions will help you figure out what are those top three things that are either hurting me the most and or are the biggest opportunities for me to grow. You're just taking a step back, looking at your execution in terms of the macro plan and micro, what are your specific actions on a second by second basis as you're studying and performing. And then you're putting that into an overall list of here are all the possible things I could improve. What are the top three? Next thing to audit is your energy. Not am I energetic or energetic enough, but how energetic am I? And let's define this more specifically. You've got the physical level of energy and the mental level of energy. Physical comes primarily from sleep, diet, exercise, and debatably stress. How good is your sleep? Zero to 100. How good is your diet? Zero to 100. Give yourself a number. How good is your exercise? Zero to 100. Give yourself a number. Are any of those things holding you back? Is it primarily your execution that's holding you back? Or is that a bigger opportunity? Or is maybe your energy level the bigger opportunity? Maybe maybe you're executing well, or you maybe you could get two birds with one stone, so to speak, by optimizing your sleep diet exercise, which would make you a better executor under pressure and give you more energy and time to evaluate your plan on a higher level, something to consider. Now, there's also the mental side of energy, which is how focused are you? Zero to 100. Are you clear on what your top three focus areas are right now? Are you clear on what you're supposed to be doing at this phase in your preparation? And maybe the deeper question is, how clear are you? Do you need to reach out to someone at your uh, provider company's support team and figure out, hey, I'm here. Is this where I'm supposed to be? Is this right? How much should I be working on this content area versus this other one? If your provider provides that kind of service. Or maybe you just have to do a self-audit Maybe you're one of the more financially constrained people in the GMAT space right now, and you're having to do a lot of this with free resources. There's nothing wrong with that. You just have to be a little more responsible for your own optimization. So can you find some high-quality free resources to become more focused? Something to consider. Along the mental lines, you have focus. And then focus, in my opinion, is really about what we say no to. I think that's a Steve Jobs quote, actually. That's one of my favorite Steve Jobs quotes focuses about what you say no to. I might be butchering that, but I'm, I'm in the ballpark. So you, you could ask yourself, could I eliminate more? Could I take more things off my plate? That's another measure of how focused I am, is how many different things is my attention plugged into? You burn out a circuit by having it plugged into too many things at once or having too many things plugged into the circuit at once. You can decrease the odds of burnout or stop burnout by unplugging stuff from the circuit and rebooting it. You might have to do that with your attention something to think about. Then, of course, you also have the emotional side of energy. I think that that is less important for GMAT prep, 
Uh, having said that, emotional energy can be a super valuable tool. And for a lot of you, your emotions and your intellect, intellect, excuse me, are quite closely connected. And that's part of the reason you want to go to grad school in the first place. You're just excited by the learning and growth process. That's cool. Maybe you can tap into that more. So some questions for you. Could I enjoy this more? What's my enjoyment level of this process on a scale of zero to 100? Could I be more balanced and healthy emotionally? Or is that not really a determining factor for me? Should that be put in the binary space or should I bring it into the gradient continuum space and unlock a next level of effort on it? Could I be better at turning on my competitiveness when the time is there to focus that intense energy? And could I be better at shutting it down when it's time to relax, recoup, rejuvenate, et cetera? So those are all emotional factors that could affect your energy levels. So how good are you at turning it on and turning it off at the right times. I gave you a system for that back in the balance episode again a few weeks back. If, if you want to grow with that and you want a clear, pretty simple system for doing that, that's what I lay out for you in that episode. Okay, so we've got knowledge, uh, excuse me, we've got execution and energy. Those are two of the main factors I've found that really help people get great GMAT results. If you're executing well with reasonable energy, you're probably making progress. You're at least getting better. And then if you're looking for that next level, like a lot of you are, like admittedly, I generally am, <laughs> this is one way that you can unlock that. Okay, so I already talked about the knowledge thing. That might be obvious, but I do want to touch on it here. Just give yourself a score zero to 100 in terms of your knowledge of the basics of the GMAT, basic strategies for each of the question types, basic understanding of the prep process, and then basic like facts, figures, times tables, how to do algebra, how to solve critical reasoning questions, that kind of stuff. Scale of zero to 100, how well do you know that content knowledge? C could you know it better? Should you be thinking about it more on a gradient and rather than just binary, know it or don't know it? Maybe you could even extend this to how well do you know it under time pressure? Maybe it's time for you to get some help performing better in a pressure environment. Maybe you know the content well in practice, but when the lights go on, so to speak, you tend to blank out. That's something you can improve. That, that's a skill. Handling pressure is a skill. You might have a natural deficiency with that. What are you going to do about that except either decide to get better or accept that you're always going to be bad at it? I mean, those are pretty much the two options I see. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Maybe you're naturally great under pressure. That's awesome too. There's, there's a whole gradient of natural abilities that all of us either have or don't have. And a lot of the joy of this process, I think, is learning to transcend those boundaries. Looking at those things where you thought, maybe I'm always going to be bad under pressure and realizing like, oh, wow, I actually got better. Like that's actually pretty exciting. This is cool. Now there's all these opportunities in front of me that I wasn't aware of before. Maybe that is the key for you personally to move out of the binary mindset from a big picture perspective about yourself and your identity and move more into the continuum mindset. It's not really like a personal development podcast, so to speak, but that's something I've had a lot of success with, just, just saying. So the, the, the question I always try to ask myself and for my clients is, do they know this material well enough that they basically can't lose? Which is another way of saying, could they know it better? It's not just do they know it, it's not just did they get the goal score, but like how, how well would they have to know it so that they could not not get the goal score, even if they had the worst performance ever? How well would they have to know it? It's something to consider. Maybe you'd like to adopt that for yourself. Maybe that's not an issue for you. Maybe the content's good. I don't know. Just inviting you to try on some of these things and keep what works for you. Okay, the last thing I want to touch on here is your time management. This is from a macro perspective and also a micro perspective. So give yourself a score of zero to 100 for your macro time management. This is your overall balance of work, play, restorative time, and productive time, in this case, studying for the exam or handling your applications. So zero to 100, what's your score? And then just ask yourself, maybe even delete the zero to 100 for this one. Ask yourself, how could my macro time management be better? And don't even limit yourself to a continuum. In fact, if you've found that zero to 100 scale limiting, delete it and just go to the infinite continuum mindset. It's great. Could always be better. We could smash 100. What's, what would it take to get to 300 or 1,000? 
Then you have the micro time management, which is during the exam or during practice problems. How good am I at guessing when I need to? Could I be faster at recognizing when I need to guess? And when I invest, could I be better at recognizing when I should invest in problems or certain topics? And could I become better at investing when I do decide to double down and go to that two, three, three and a half minute span where I'm kind of taking away from a future problem to get this current problem? Sometimes that's a good investment. That can be a very valuable decision. I've talked about in the, that in the past, by the way. If you want a little bit more structure around your time management, that's in the GMAT quant uh, for 2024 episode, which I think was in February-ish, give or take. And the, again, the key is just the continuum mindset helps you continue to improve, which means faster growth and faster growth rate and faster results, which as you may or may not have figured out by this point is my obsession. <laughs> one of them, one of many. So just to wrap all this up uh, with the GMAT, if you shift some of these things to the infinite continuum mindset and you continue to improve your plan, you continue to improve your execution, you continue to improve your energy, you will definitely continue to improve your performance and your improvement rate will increase, which is how you capture exponential growth and how you're done with this thing as fast as possible with actually technically the minimum amount of effort over the long haul, which is kind of interesting. So. There's a pool of people who will continue to do those things. They'll get better, faster, stronger, more competitive over time. And the thing that I want to kind of tie this off with, or at least start to tie it off with, is it doesn't really matter where you start with all of this. I've said this in the past, and maybe I'll go into more detail in this in the future, but just for now, like I don't think I was very good at any of this when I started studying for the GMAT. And, and like for a long time before that too, unfortunately. Now, I like to think of it as, okay, I look back on when I was younger and less experienced, and I'm embarrassed with how bad of a performer I was. <laughs> and I see that as a positive in some ways, because that means I've grown a lot. Like now at this stage in my life and career, I can look back on that and, and like see the gaps, so to speak. So that seems like a sign of growth and progress. I, I like to frame it that way personally, because getting down on myself for something I did in the past, like isn't really a helpful use of attention or energy unless I'm going to change something in the present or future. And that's my personal opinion. So what I'm trying to do is just say like, if, if you feel guilty or you feel bad about what you've been doing with this or how you've been performing with this, there's like literally never a better time to change that and adopt a different mindset than right now. Because it doesn't really matter where you start with your GMAT prep. Like zero business schools are going to be like, yeah, but what was your starting GMAT score? <laughs> no school has ever asked that and they will not ask you that. At least, I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe I am going to unlock that. And I don't know, maybe that'll be a good thing. Like, wow, you started at a 500 and you got to 650. You know, like, that's awesome. That's a great accomplishment. I don't know. Maybe we're going to start judging people on that. But as of today... Pretty much every school is just going to care where you finish. What was your, what, what was the final score? What was the most recent score? Just give us the highlight. And that's important because what you'll ultimately realize is the only thing that matters there is how much you can grow between now and when it's time to apply. So that's what I've tried to give you today is some frameworks and a system for applying that framework to the exam and your studies, and if you want to extend it to other things, the potential to do that. So if you do the above, everything I mentioned, your growth rate will definitely continue to expand. You'll get compounding returns, which probably means not just the life you want and are dreaming of right now, but even more. And not to go too long with this, but that's been my experience, and that's what I want for you. So again, if you have questions about your specific situation, if you're not sure about any of the stuff that I discussed here, if you're like, wait, how does this apply to me? Or I have a question, you should be able to reach us at the GMAT strategy on current social channels. And I'll mention the website again in just a moment. As always, my greatest hope is that this material will make your studies as easy and as painless as they can possibly be. If you want more tips and strategies for optimizing your performance on the GMAT, head to our website, thegmatstrategy.com, which is linked in the description of this podcast and the description of this episode. It should be a clickable link if you're on mobile. You don't have to type anything if you don't want to. And check out our free video presentation on how to reach your dream GMAT score in half the normal time. It's about 40 minutes long, and it can totally change the game for you.
In the meantime, this is a weekly show, so please subscribe. And as always, stay positive and stay consistent with your studies. I'll talk to you all soon.